Hi everybody, this is Dr. Katie Bailey and today we're going to talk about salivary gland lesions. Our objectives are to re briefly review normal anatomy and the imaging appearance of the salivary glands, to discuss benign and malignant neoplasms, and to discuss infectious, inflammatory, and systemic processes that affect the salivary glands. To start, the salivary glands consist of the parotid glands, the submandibular glands, the sublingual glands, and you have salivary rests throughout the head and neck, including within the paranasal sinuses. So here is a schematic of the different salivary glands. The parotid gland is the largest salivary gland and is composed of adipose and glandular tissues in nearly equal proportions. So on CT, it appears isodense to fat and on MRI, it appears isointense to fat. It's divided into superficial and deep lobes by the retromandibular vein, which you can see right here, kind of courses through it. The parotid glands drain via Stenson's ducts, and this traverses superficial to the masseter muscle and passes through the buccinator muscle before it opens into the oral cavity at the second maxillary molar. Now remember the distal part of the facial nerve and its terminal branches pass through the parotid parenchyma. Accessory parotid gland is noted in about 20% of patients, is usually located anterior to the main parotid gland, it's superior to Stenson's duct. So if you see parotid gland here, you might see some accessory parotid tissue anterior to that normal parotid tissue. The submandibular glands are located behind and below the ramus of the mandible in the submandibular triangle. The superficial lobe of the submandibular gland is in the submandibular space, but the deep lobe is considered to be within the sublingual space. So here is the submandibular gland right here. The main submandibular duct, aka Wharton's duct, runs anteriorly in the sublingual space in the floor of mouth to the sublingual papilla on the ipsilateral side of the frenulum of the tongue. So you'd be looking for Wharton's duct traversing here. Here are stones filling Wharton's duct, so it outlines it well. This is the genioglossus muscle, the mylohyoid muscle, and then here's the mandible where the muscles attach anterior to the uh, where Wharton's duct will come out. The sublingual glands are also contained within the floor of mouth. Um, also, you have subepithelial minor salivary glands within the floor of mouth. Now, the sublingual glands empty via numerous small ducts at the mucosa of the floor of the mouth called the rivenous ducts. A defect in the mylohyoid muscle, which can be called a mylohyoid boutonniere, is a normal anatomic variant in the floor of mouth where that sublingual gland becomes visible. Usually the sublingual gland is tucked up into that floor of mouth musculature and you will not see it on every scan. So here's that sublingual gland anterior to the submandibular gland. Salivary neoplasms, the good thing is they tend to be benign. Um, this ratio is proportional to the gland size. So the parotid gland being the larger salivary gland tends to have benign neoplasms. The submandibular gland being the second largest, it's more of a 50-50, a lesion could be benign or malignant. And the sublingual glands and the accessory glands, if they have a lesion, it tends to be more malignant. So statistically, the parotid gland will have the most tumors. So salivary gland neoplasms, 70% are located within the parotid gland, about 22% in the minor salivary glands, including those sublingual glands, and about 8% in the submandibular glands. Overall, about 80% of parotid masses are benign, and the majority of these are pleomorphic adenomas. So the most common benign neoplasms are pleomorphic adenoma, and Worthen's tumor. The most common malignant neoplasms are mucoepidermoid carcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma, and of course metastatic disease to the lymph nodes within and around the parotid gland, especially from cutaneous scalp cancers. And there are lymph nodes in the salivary glands, so you can get lymphoma within the glands as well. So the pleomorphic adenoma or the benign mixed tumor is the most common tumor of the parotid. The patients are typically middle age, slightly higher in women than men. On CT, they tend to be homogeneous and hyperdense and can exhibit prominent enhancement. When they're larger, they can be more heterogeneous in density with less prominent enhancement. They can have areas of necrosis, possibly some areas of delayed enhancement. They can get small regions of calcification. So here's a classic appearance of a pleonorphic adenoma on a CT scan. 
On MRI, small tumors tend to be more homogeneous in signal. The larger tumors get more heterogeneous. They tend to be low on T1 and usually very hyperintense on T2. They can have this rim of T2 hypointensity, which is the fibrous capsule of the lesion. On MRI, these also tend to demonstrate homogeneous enhancement, though it can be heterogeneous as they get larger. So here it is on a sagittal CT image showing hyperdense, well-circumscribed mass. Next, we have the Warthin tumor, aka lymphomatous papillary cystadenoma. These are also benign. In up to 20% of cases, they can be bilateral or multifocal. These are more common in men, usually in the sixth decade, and they favor the parotid tail region. About 30% undergo cystic change, and they can have a mural nodule. So on MRI, these lesions tend to demonstrate low to intermediate T1 signal. The cyst can have cholesterol components, so they could be higher in intensity on T1. On T2, they tend to be heterogeneous with variable signal intensity and the solid parts usually enhance. So when you have bilateral parotid gland lesions, statistically, they're more likely to be Warthin's tumors. Notice this one has that cystic change in it, larger on the left side. But here are those bilateral ones with a little bit of mural nodularity on the coronal CT image. The mucoepidermoid carcinoma is the most common primary parotid malignancy. Low-grade tumors appear well circumscribed with cystic components, so there is an overlap with the imaging features of the benign salivary gland lesions. However, higher-grade lesions have poorly defined margins, they infiltrate locally, and they appear solid. So the low-grade tumors on T1 tend to be low to intermediate in signal, and those cystic areas would be low on T1 but hyperintense on T2. There can be heterogeneous enhancement of the solid components. The higher grade tumors, however, are lower signal on T2, have those poorly defined margins, and rarely show cystic areas. So they tend to be low to intermediate on T1 and intermediate to low on T2. So this is a mucoepidermoid carcinoma. You can see it's infiltrating the gland. It is low signal on that T2. It's kind of intermediate to low on T1. It has irregular infiltrative enhancement. When you have a malignant parotid or other salivary gland lesion, it is always important to check the cranial nerves. Uh, you look at thin cut, uh, fat sat, post contrast T1 to look for that perineural spread, especially at the skull base. And you should image up to and including the cavernous situs in the inner ear. This is abnormal enhancement of that right geniculate ganglion as well as the facial nerve. This was perineural spread of tumor along that right facial nerve. And you can see abnormal enhancement within foramen oval. This was also uh, perineural spread through the trigeminal nerve. And here that is abnormal enhancement throughout that right Meckel's cave from foramen oval going into that Meckel's cave. Adenoid cystic carcinoma more commonly arises in the minor salivary glands than the major salivary glands. This is the most common sinonasal tumor of salivary origin. On MRI, these lesions tend to be hypo to iso intense on T1, slightly hyper intense on T2, with the higher grade lesions again being markedly hypo intense, just like the mucoepidermoid. There tends to be homogeneous enhancement, especially when it's a smaller lesion. And these are ones you always want to look for perineural spread of tumor. Adenoid cystic carcinoma is classic for that. So on CT, you can see a subtle mass, which is hyperdense compared to the adjacent normal parotid parenchyma. It's very infiltrative throughout that parotid gland, makes it much more suspicious rather than a discrete, well-circumscribed lesion. Metastatic disease to the parotid gland is mostly to the intraparotid lymph nodes and most commonly from supraclavicular neoplasms, such as cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas of the scalp. They can be solitary or multifocal, most frequently found in the parotid tail. And just like other malignancies, they can have ill-defined margins, areas of central necrosis. So here you see this infiltrative mass within the parotid gland, some areas of necrosis centrally. You don't have good defined margins. You see the mass is actually tenting the skin of the cheek. It has grown fast enough to do that. There's no clear separation of this big infiltrative mass from the dermis or even the epidermis and this was a parotid metastatic lesion. The same patient eight months later on MRI, again, you see this infiltrative mass filling that parotid gland. It has some irregular 
enhancement. You don't have good margins. It's tenting the skin. Here it is hyper intense on T2. This is the same case just a little bit later. Approximately 2% of all salivary gland tumors are primary non-Hodgkin lymphoma. 75% of these are seen in the parotid gland. You can get malt B-cell lymphoma, follicular B-cell lymphoma, and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. These are the most common subtypes found in the salivary gland. The MALT type is considered to have a more favorable outcome than the other subtypes. This was a MALT lymphoma in a patient with Sjogren's. You see this lobulated heterogeneous density mass with internal areas of hypodensity, almost like a striated appearance. This increased rapidly in size over time, and this was removed and found to be a MALT lymphoma. Now, Sjogren disease is an autoimmune condition of the exocrine glands, the second most common autoimmune disorder. It affects women in their fourth and fifth decades. The salivary glands have a salt and pepper or honeycomb type appearance. You can see that here with areas that are like rounded and hyperdense with kind of fatty strands in between them. Uh, the lacrimal glands demonstrate fatty atrophy, meaning they're difficult to see on CT scan or even on MRI. This is an important disease process because these patients do have an increased risk of lymphoma and it can be hard to diagnose clinically. So imaging, it can give us the idea of this abnormal appearance of the salivary glands. You don't see good lacrimal glands. You can suggest these findings with Sjogren disease. Lymphoepithelial cysts are well-circumscribed cystic lesions within the parotid glands. Usually they can demonstrate some thin peripheral enhancement, and these are seen in HIV due to lymphoid hyperplasia obstructing the intraglandular cysts. So here's one of those big lymphoepithelial cysts. It has a thin wall. In this case, it does not show a lot of peripheral enhancement, but you can get these cysts within the glands. When you see this appearance, you can suggest looking for HIV. Sialolithiasis is formation of calculi inside the ducts or parenchyma of the salivary glands, most common in the submandibular glands in their ducts, usually seen in men in that middle age range between 30 and 60. CT is the exam of choice. You do not necessarily need contrast for this, though contrast can show inflammation of the gland if there is an obstruction from the stone. Um, the gland can appear large, hyperdense, and have stranding and enhancement. Uh, in chronic cases, you get fatty atrophy of the gland. So here is a big stone within that left submandibular gland. Here is a stone in that left anterior floor of mouth. And you can see it sometimes better on the bone windowed images, especially if the patients have a lot of dental hardware. Sialadenitis is inflammation of a salivary gland. It can occur in various forms from acute bacterial sialadenitis to acute viral to more of a chronic inflammation. Acute is most commonly caused by an ascending bacterial infection, Staph A or Strep V being the most common organisms. Others can purely be dehydration, immunosuppression, iatrogenic like drug-induced causes, and epidemic Parotitis is associated with the mumps virus. It's usually bilateral. So that would be inflammation of both parotid glands associated with a viral infection. But inflammation within a gland, you see it enlarged. You see that stranding around it, heterogeneous enhancement. This is a sialadenitis of that left parotid gland. All right, so for a practice case, you have this lesion in the superficial lobe of the left parotid gland. Based on the CT features, do you favor it being benign or malignant? The correct answer for this case is malignant. If you look at the images, there is a primary squamous carcinoma of the conchal bowl of the outer ear of the pinna, and these were metastatic. Uh, deposits, including in that left parotid gland. So here's the primary cancer. Here is another metastatic lesion. And thank you for your attention.